and welcome back to another episode of the Conversations with Chuck podcast, joined by the man himself, Mr. Chuck Bennington. And today we have a very special guest in Mr. Colin Noble. So I'm really excited today. I've got two of my favourite humans in the one place. Uh, this is actually the first time that Chuck and Colin have got to meet. Uh, I know that you guys have it's had wild man. We've talked yeah. so much over the last like two and a half, three years that like that really struck me when we first jumped into like the the studio. Yeah, it's studio. and I know that Colin and I have had lots of conversations about um, Chuck, um, you know, stuff that you've posted and our my journey through Fit Filiate and as Colin sort of dipped into that stuff and I know that he's always been um a lot of your thoughts and feelings and experience have resonated well. And today I came into our chat thinking, well, you know, talking about role modeling in behaviors and, and life experiences, because you're both, you know, um, dads and husbands and coaches, and you've got all those sort of things, but then you've got your personal journey that feeds into that. And I know yeah. that resonated with Colin. So I thought we could just rumble around with some of those things today and, um, and see what, what shakes out. Rumble and bumble. Well, good to yeah. good to officially meet you, sir. It's uh, yeah. it's weird. I jumped in like I feel like I'm a guest on you guys' podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nah. yeah. I guess um, yeah. It, I, I guess that's the way of the world with social media these days. Like you, you, you reach out to these people, and then when you finally get to meet them, it's it's so weird. It's like, oh, I know you, but. You know, yeah really yeah man it, but... especially like you know i know that it's like the focal point of probably will be a huge milestone of our entire generation but like you know post covid like just the volume of digital interaction that so many people got that i don't know that they previously had just yeah. like with you know who i am and what i've done and as i've moved through my coaching career and kind of business journey social media and remote communication has been just like i haven't known another world in coaching without it prior to just not really being in coaching full time. Um, but yeah, man, everybody, everybody knows each other very well remotely. Uh, yeah. Interesting. I know that we've talked a lot on the podcast, Chuck, when I'm talking about your stories, it's like from, a, you know, thousands of kilometers away, I still feel like that I can see the connection that you have in your family and, and, you know, like the, the fun that you guys are having. And it's like, Oh yeah, I was there when you did that, but it's like we've just seen it all through a screen. It's it's kind of a unique perspective. Yeah, I was actually just uh, writing out like a little coaching development piece on um, improving communication and connection skills through understanding the things that you are more repressive or expressive about. And if you can find the shit that you love, that like you can't help but move your hands and be super excited when you talk like you're going to be fine if you can frame your delivery in public speaking and as a coach as an educator as a teacher as like a father a husband if you can find the pieces that you can lean into that excite you and you can be expressive man it's so much better but yeah there's a my family lights me up for sure it's like i guess like milestone moments right like so covid big milestone moment and then earlier before we jumped on, as I think has been the case in every single one of these that we've done, I was like, I was making a coffee, yes. but I couldn't find my coffee cup. And so this is like the backup one. And this is Vanessa's <laughs> tiny human tamer. Um, but I think like that's another really interesting milestone. And that's something that I'm interested in getting your perspective on Colin is, you know, the kind of the origin and intent of the podcast is really just for me to like document stuff for Liam and to explore my own thinking and relationships with shit. So give me a couple like moments or just word vomit on how you see the relationship of being a father and being a coach uh, phrased differently. Like I'm interested to see how you think about fatherhood as a coaching role. Oh, no well, uh, pressure. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I, like, or do I you see fatherhood as a coaching role? And maybe that's better. That that is on me for phrasing that and asking poorly because I'm nah. an assumption of like your own belief structure. But like, I see coaching and and fatherhood as very very intertwined. At least for me. Oh, sure. they they're one and the same. Um, I remember having a conversation with my father-in-law couple of years ago when I, I moved into a leadership role at work and um and I said at that time I was like oh I don't know if I see myself as as a leader or you know and I was going through a coach development like at the same time and you know self-doubting and 
as you do. And he said, you've, you've got a daughter, you're a coach, you're a leader. That's, that's <laughs> what you do. It's, you do it for, for free every day, just not even thinking about it. So, so yeah, it's, um, uh, it's 100%. It's probably the most important coaching role. Um, you know, given the, uh, probably some of the upbringings and the life lessons I've had in my childhood with, you know, my father and, and my mother as well. It's, um, yeah, there's, there's definitely things that I take from that and I try and profess onto my kids. Yeah. Um, but then at the same time, there's a lot that I don't want to be the same as well. Like, right. Yeah. Ever not. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, it's 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 easily the most important coaching role. I think I'm I'm, I'm with you on that one. Yeah, they're the yeah. one in the same. Well, and I think like that most people would like you know if they can if they can kind of like go over that bridge to be like okay, I see parenting and coaching as like kind of one of the same. And be like yeah, it's it is the most important coaching. It's the most important coach client relationship you'll ever have. <laughs> you know, for all of all of the reasons, good and bad, right and wrong. So are there as you're as you're kind of navigating fatherhood or they're like i don't know give me one thing that you got from coaching that you're executing on or implementing in fatherhood um resilience in the moment okay There's, that's a yeah. good one yeah mm. Isn't this, that um, such an interesting thing? Oh, I love these fucking conversations. <laughs> these these make me excited and happy cuz I'm interested for both of you like was resiliency in the moment something that somebody curated for you? Or is that something that, is this one of those examples of like, man, I didn't get as much of it as I probably could have. So this is a really important thing for me to pass along. Oh, for uh, resilience in the moment, I need to get better at in every single walk of my three lives, be it coaching, um, work, or, you know, family. So, um, I actually done a course through work on resilience in the moment. Um, and it's something that I'm, I'm, you know, redhead, somewhat Irish descent, mostly English, a little bit of Viking in there somewhere probably, but um, can, can hit the, the rev limiter um, if I want to, but I uh, get him better at not doing that. Um, I once had to get, so I've got some, so we did the ancestry DNA thing. So I've got, I've got a fair bit of like Nordic and Scandinavian genealogy. So another little connection with us there, but I was also at one point ordered to anger management because I threw a, a rolling office chair across the office. It was a flying <laughs> office chair rather than a rolling office chair that is frowned <laughs> upon. So empathetic in that, um, I've, I don't, it's funny I've, I've I know something. most people that know me now would characterize me or classify me as an angry person, like in any way whatsoever. But like for sure, the uh, the rage monster lived with within me for a while. Yeah, I done something similar when I was fifteen at school. Um, so I've got three sisters. Um, th they're, they're half sisters, but just say them as sisters. Um, yeah. But they're all a lot older than me. Um, so my eldest sister and my mum, and this is a big mind fuck moment for you, my eldest sister and my mum were pregnant at the same time <laughs> with me and my nephew. And um, so I was actually an uncle four months before I was born, which okay. is super <laughs> weird. So we went through school together, primary school, high school, you know, we come from a pretty small little village in Northwest yeah. England. And... Um, we grew up and we fought like brothers and uh, my brother, uh, brother, my nephew had some um, uh, tumultuous times with, uh, with his mum in, in his teenage years. And he was just being a fucking dick and he was just being a dick at school. And I called him out for it in the middle of a, I think it was a French class. And he said something like, I don't know, being an asshole and all the girls around him, like started laughing. So I just stood up pick this wooden, like, old, proper old seven, 1970s wooden school chair and just threw it. So All was frowned thing. upon, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I got kicked out of class. So. <laughs> mm. 
well. I think so they, resiliency in the moment is something that you're you're really like deliberately curating. Um, and it sounds like mm-hmm. maybe, like that was something you struggled with earlier in life, and you know even yeah. do present day, and just like trying to yeah. trying to pay it forward and like leave it better than you found it, and set your daughter up to be more successful with that. What about you, Lisa? Did did anybody curate resiliency in the moment with you? No, I think it was just something I developed through like early life. Um, you know, difficult um, childhood, I guess. And you learn to be, I had to learn to uh, figure things out on the fly and to avoid, you know, being in trouble or, or you know, being on the wrong side of, of whoever it was I was with at the time. So that helped me then as I, you know, progress through jobs and that. But then into coaching is like, and hopefully Colin will uh, validate it, but, you know, members would regularly comment that, you know, Lisa will just pivot real hard and get shit sorted and it just will look seamless. Like, it doesn't matter what... <laughs> was what's... not always the case, though. <laughs> no, was not always the case. But it's, it's you know, when something would happen, it's like, okay, well, now we're just going to go do this and just try and make it as seamless as possible without, you know, world ending. But it's a, it's a skill that definitely takes some um, work and acquisition and then one day you just, you just... You know, that's just how you operate. It's, well, um, yeah. And, like, you know, you don't always have it. It's not like the switch that's, like, forever switched on. But, like, it gets mm. easier to turn the switch on faster and more regularly. And the hope is that, like, over time the switch will stay stuck in that position. And mm. the opportunities for it to flip the other direction is more like like a breaker in a storm. Where you're like, yep. oh, I, I deviated from the default operating <laughs> I've now chosen to embody in my life. Because shit is way better um let me get back to baseline but that's a that's a good one i like that mm. that's a, for sure one of those like easier said than done ones mm. um well i know that like something that we kind of messaged back and forth about uh and maybe like i think it's a good segue into it because it's a lot of like the resiliency in the moment is kind of figuring out relationships with alcohol and i I've been lucky enough to be kind of tested in some interesting conversations through the years because I've definitely, I have found that, you know, like shame cannot exist in the light. And so it's a whole lot easier for me to talk more regularly, openly, and oftenly about. Um, And that's actually like a piece of kind of like, you know, my like maintenance and recovery strategy for lack of any kind of better words is like, dude, most people have a fucking weird relationship with alcohol. Most people are struggling with it. Like, Raise your hand if you've ever said that I'm never drinking again and actually fucking stuck to it. Like, virtually the whole plan is like, fuck that one up like at least once a week for a huge portion of my life and then like once a month and now maybe like a couple times a year. Yeah. Um, Or at least like that's, you know, been the, what I would say is very like stereotypical. So, yeah, man. Um, now that we've kind of got an opportunity to, and especially like given the nature of this podcast, I think that's something that I know from my own conversations, not just with you, but with a ton of people through the years, because I'm a little bit more public about it. Um, it's a helpful, valuable thing present day to talk through for myself and for other people. And I'm like still trying to figure out my own relationship with it. And I'll give more context to that as we go. But I think this is something that will be good for Liam, or at least I hope that it is something that would have been helpful for me to have sooner in life, because I think a lot of my views around like alcohol, addiction, recovery, they're not super congruent with a lot of that world, which is a big piece of why, like, admittedly, I struggled enormously through most of my life, even though I had been kind of interjected into intervention and like treatment options fairly early on. Um, My mom had me in like drug and alcohol counseling um, early on in high school is the first time I started going to like some one-on-one counseling sessions kind of in and around that. So anyway, at this point I'm just rambling, but like that gives a little (laughs) bit more context, but yeah, dude, just kind of ask away with anything that, you know, is on your mind or you think would be helpful. Um, Yeah, I guess, um, I guess the big thing for me is like, I, I grew up uh, with two alcoholic parents, uh, so they both passed away from uh, organ failure due to alcohol abuse. Okay. Um, so I lost my mum at 16, um, and then my dad, pr- 
probably um, probably 10 or 12 years later. Uh, and when my mum died at 16, when I was 16, I gave, you know, my dad a big spray and, you know, I told him that, you know, he's gone down the same road and he wouldn't last 12 months and stubborn bastard lasted another 12 years. But anyways, um, <laughs> there was, I'm interested, like, yeah, uh, there was no behavior change from him, like at that point. Nah, nah. And okay. I think, I guess, I guess uh, like the, there's a few fractures in, in, in my family, you know, between my mom and my dad and, and the relationship there and, and the alcohol abuse, you know, but I think it's, um, I think they were both two, two people already on that path and they just kind of collided and, and then there was just pretty well no hope. Um, so it got to the point where, you know, they didn't work. Um, my mum did for a long time. She's a baker. So she was up early in the morning and then home at, you know, early afternoon, but because she'd been up for a long time, then it was, you know, it was just normal to, to drink quite early in, in the afternoon. Yeah. Um, and my dad got to the point where he was a bit of a, he was a bit of a free spirit, my dad. So it's, um, same. Yeah. He, uh, he, he kind of just done whatever he wanted and, and that was it. Um, I, think he was quite, I think he was quite spoiled by his mum and dad, like my grandma and granda. Uh, he was always seen as a bit of a golden child, but yeah. um, so he could never do any wrong. But he, um, so so for for my my childhood, like growing up in and around alcohol was just normal. Yeah, but it wasn't um, it wasn't like normal, like having a beer when you get home from work and then having a glass of wine with your dinner. It was, you know, to the point where are we going to have dinner? Like so. That was that was pretty tough, but and I guess that the thing for me in my battle is now is um, not to be like that with um, with my kids. Yeah, uh, I guess I guess for me, some of the reassurances I try to give myself is I know there's a line, so if I'm aware that there's a line, I'm less likely to step across it. Yeah, before I've already stepped across it. But um, but yeah, but like. And and my my big battles of the years are um, the the whole culture in Northwest England. Like, so I played rugby, team sports. Saturday after your game had finished, you'd be in the shower with the boys, and then that would be it. You know, you'd be on the piss till Sunday night. You know, and then you wouldn't drink it until the weekend. So it was a, a very much like a binge, yeah, type of a, a relationship, and then. Uh, move to Australia and then quite the opposite, but still have a bit of a binge on the weekend where it's a lot more social to, to drink at home. So yeah. Um, yeah. Just, just balance and balance and a couple of those mindset. Yes. Yeah. I, I think like, man, there's, there's a lot in that. Um, there's a lot of different <laughs> directions we can go. So I think that having spent a lot of time around a lot of, drugs outside of like alcohol but like drug drug stuff i think that like dealing with alcohol is really unique as far as like substance abuse issue things because there's so many super strong social and cultural tie-ins there's so much availability it's so inexpensive it's so excusable it's so permissible um at least, you know, for me, like that, that has been a thing that I have struggled with because, you know, in my weaker moments and not that I'm like, maybe like it's better to, to set a, like a precedent. Um, I still drink. I, I had a whiskey and diet Coke with lunch yesterday at a new restaurant that we went to. Um, and then Vanessa and I had uh, a couple glasses of wine, probably like six or seven hours later um, at home while we were doing laundry, cooking dinner, uh, just getting set up for the week. So still drink occasionally. Um, that being said, that was a big piece of where I struggled initially in building a better relationship with alcohol is because the the amount of time and energy that I had to spend on probably constructs of like motivation or discipline or willpower, like however you want to phrase it, like there's just, there's so many battles to fight 
so often in so many situations and scenarios. And I, I do have the capacity and capability to like manage my relationship with alcohol in a better way. So the thing that was really hard for me initially was that that world is based out of like entirely like sobriety. Like that is it. You are, it is binary. You either don't drink at all or like you build whatever relationship that you have with alcohol, but because of your base characteristics, traits, fucking nature, nurture, like whatever the thing is, you are a person that if you drink at all in any quantity and any timing, like you are an alcoholic and like, it's not a thing that you have the capacity or ability to control. So I think a lot of that I, I took a ton of issue with initially because this is way, way before I got into coaching. You know, this was me all the way back in like fucking high school. I was like, it doesn't seem to be binary in most things in life, especially probably this one. And why would you ever build a base relationship with somebody in any type of behavioral issue, like from this foundation of like, I am powerless over X, right? Like my name's mm -hmm. Chuck, I'm an alcoholic. As we go through the 12 steps, like I admit that I am powerless over alcohol. Like in what fucking world does, does condoning no power whatsoever end up empowering somebody to be in a better place? I know for yes. millions of people, all over the world that absolute sobriety is for sure the answer for them with drugs and alcohol and like whatever is working for you that you're happy don't fuck it up because of like how <laughs> i look at things but that was always really difficult for me to find any amount of congruence on is like i am powerless all right now let's go make big behavior changes so that was really fucking hard right and so i, I don't like the construct of like being powerless over an addiction um and then I also look at, you know, probably the same way we can consider most things that we've seen even in fitness play out, like how many people end up being fitter humans later in life than they ever were at their best years in like, you know, mm. high school or university. Huh. Fucking mm. most of them, right? Like most of the gym populations that you guys have ever dealt with, like at 35 to 55 years old, they could beat the shit out of like the 15 to 21 year old <laughs> versions of themselves, like in every way. And so would we agree that humans are adaptable creatures? For and sure. so maybe yeah. If we reframe like, you know, our relationship with alcohol is a skill, like we can, mm. we can build awareness of it, set kind of a baseline understanding and then like work on improving the relationship as a skill. And so that's really kind of like where I found more long-term success with it. Um, but I think like we were maybe talking in the DMs and you'd asked if like there was ever like a milestone moment where it was like what, what we call it generally in coaching and like with affiliate and at least like my phrase that I use is a, crystal a crystallization of discontent. Like where we get sick and tired of being sick and tired or where something is bad enough that a should becomes a must a want becomes a need like there is a in in the recovery world they say like rock bottom a lot and i did very much so have like a a rock bottom not of where i was in life but in kind of my my experience of being able to look at this thing in some kind of way to build my own like framework for looking at, at drug and alcohol stuff and it's when i was in an inpatient program after my dui so after my dui i had been ordered into a 28-day inpatient program at harbor crest behavioral health and as i tell the story generally i say it's like you know any given group counseling session like on a wednesday at 11 a.m and if anybody's ever been to rehab or like a treatment center like there's that after breakfast kind of early morning <laughs> fucking group jamboree where really everybody just like sits in a giant circle and like fucking waves their dick around about like how victimized they were, how fucking rough their story is. Like, it's just really this big bitch fest. Not that it's not important to get shit off your chest. Not that it's not important to like talk about our struggles and our problems out loud and like shine light on it so that shame isn't there. But at some point, like, that's probably not the most helpful thing. Anyway, whatever. Now I'm ranting in another direction. But <laughs> it was in one of those group counseling sessions after having been there for probably, like, maybe maybe it was, like, second or third week. And it was listening to these fucking exhaustingly, excruciatingly sad stories about these people that had just 
fucked their life up over and over and over. And you've got people that are like, hey, my name's Bill. It's the fourth time I've been in this treatment center. And like, you know, the guy's in his 50s, 60s, and he's got an entire life that is just a Greek tragedy, but with no life lessons, with no humor, like with not one fucking redeeming part, just this tragic downward arc. And I did have a crystallization. I was like, I am not like these people. And I refuse to have the rest of my life be this fucking tragedy sob story. Like, yep, I fuck up. I fuck up often. I will admit to that very freely. I have fucked up catastrophically <laughs> at different points in my life. Cool. I have fucked up. I am not a fuck up. That was a big piece that has stayed with me to this day is the ability to choose your identity. And like you can choose who you associate as and our thoughts become our words, our words become our actions, our actions become our destiny. And what you choose to think about in your head and how you choose to speak about yourself like that, that very much so does manifest like the rest of your life. And so like not congruent with powerless at all. Hmm. also chose like not to identify as an alcoholic because I'm like, well, I don't want to be powerless. And like, if I'm like, this is my identity. Well, fuck hmm. that. Like I am somebody that struggles with alcohol. I am somebody that has some tendencies that trend towards addiction. I am somebody who likes to have a good time as they say in the <laughs> South. And like, that was instrumental for me and just being like, hmm. Dude, it's not fucking binary, at least not for me. And it's a thing mm -hmm. that, like, I know I'm not powerless. Otherwise, I would be blackout drunk all day, every day. And mm -hmm. so for somebody that's like, you know, if they're out there sitting on the fence or like, Liam, if you're listening to this in the future and, like, you're struggling with your own shit, like, do you have periods of your days, weeks, months, and years where, like, you are knowingly engaging in, like, not fucking your life up and being in control of all of your shit? Yeah. So you have a baseline skill. Because if you were truly powerless to that identity, mm -hmm. it would be all day every day and there would be absolutely no middle ground so so long as there is a middle ground and there is a gap you can explore that gap and make it bigger or at least this is kind of what i've come to think about and believe um and so i think like a lot of what we learn in the gym and a lot of what correlates with fitness and nutrition is like helpful to apply in any other area of life because like behaviors are behaviors and so you know maybe where it starts with somebody is gaining a greater ability to exercise that control like have you ever deliberately not drank for 30 days cool that's a really good place to start because like if you can do that then like fuck you're probably good to go for the rest of your life as long as you choose to exert control and approach it from a deliberate framework because in that span of 30 days like you have good mm. days and you have bad days mm. you have shit that you want to mourn and shit you want to celebrate You've got social encounters. You've got cultural encounters. Like, if you can do it for 30 days, like, you're inevitably going to run into shit unless, like, you make it an isolated experiment where you're, like, in rehab. Like, well, fuck. Don't drink in rehab for 30 days. Like, it's not that hard. Although, fucking <laughs> little bonus story for anybody that listens or watches. Um, and, and I love her dearly, and this would be a fun episode to record, but my mom got kicked out of my rehab for showing up with a vodka and Sprite uh, for her. <laughs> and, like, a little like, you can't do that. And she's like, what? I'm not here. I'm just visiting. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, maybe that good. gives us like a couple talking points because I feel like I'm just super ranty. But yeah, those are those yeah. are a couple things that like help me. And then that's uh, we can kind of explore mm. from there. I think I, like I guess I get, like I guess what you said there, like about, you know, your life isn't a fuck up, but you have fucked up. Like, I, I, you know, I've been to many therapy sessions talking about alcohol and grief and things like that, but I've never really heard it phrased like that. So when you put it like that, like, cause yeah. So, yeah. So like, that's, that's, that's super powerful. So exploring concept of like guilt versus shame, guilt is I did a bad thing. Shame is I am a bad thing. Mm. And mm. so for me, like they, they being the recovery world, they try to use like the association of the identity of the alcoholic as a helpful thing. Like I know because I'm an alcoholic, these are the things that I will struggle with. But I was like, I don't really like that identity. Like <laughs> I, I do some things that alcoholics also do, like have too much fun or maybe like fuck up when I'm drunk or drink mm -hmm. when I shouldn't or drink too much. But like as I looked around that sad Wednesday morning group recovery session, I was like, 
nope, we we are not <laughs> birds of a feather. We do not vibe together. We do not tribe together. Like, <laughs> we are not like things. We do a similar thing. We have had mm. some similar experiences, but you and I are not the same type of person because I choose to not associate myself as that. So yeah, like mm. that was huge for me, dude. Like you can struggle with alcohol and not be an alcoholic. You're just probably like fucking everybody. Because I would venture to guess if you passed it through that filter of like, who has drank more than they intended to? Who has drank when they intended initially to not drink? Yeah, and who everybody. has used alcohol as a coping mechanism knowingly, even though they knew that that was not the best thing? Mm -hmm. Like we could play the game all fucking day and you'd be like, so everybody in the world's an alcoholic. And you know what? There's a ton yeah. of people in the recovery world that are like, well, I mean, they're not not alcoholics. Right? They <laughs> want to drink more than they want to and they do dumb bad shit that they regret later. You're know, like, yeah, fair enough. If the shoe fits, cool. But like I chose to not have that shoe fit. And that has mm -hmm. served me very well. Yeah, I get like I've, I've never been to like I've been to many like one on one therapy sessions like to to help me with my struggles. Um, but the, the like kind of the, the your, you know, Wednesday group therapy moment or your crystallization for me was just not wanting to turn into, you know, love my parents and my parents obviously love me. And I, as much as it's going to sound like I didn't have a great childhood, I did. Like I was loved. Yeah, we were same. dirt poor, same. lived in oh. a tiny little mining village, like still got, you know, Christmas and birthday presents. There's a lot of love, but you know, when you're drunk, you love everybody, you know. So <laughs> until you want to fight them, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and 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 there was that too, you know, between my mum and dad as well. And that's probably a, a whole other. Um, that's probably where the resilience in the moment comes. But um, the um, the crystallization moment for me was um, was just looking at my dad and not wanting to be my dad you know, not wanting to turn into my dad. So um, I guess the fear for me is, you know, so I've been caught DUR twice. Okay. That's bad. Mm. Uh, so the first time was, it was just a little bit um, and, you know, kind of got a bit of a slap on the wrist. You know, I, I was in Australia, so never been caught DUI in the UK when I lived there for 26 years. And in the space of my first four years in Australia, got caught twice. And the judge the second time. So I've been through the second time. The first time was a little bit over, you know, not real good um, in a work vehicle before I'd even started my first day for this company. Like they dropped this work vehicle off for me to start my new job on Monday. And on the Friday, I got caught DUI <laughs> in the work vehicle. Yeah. When we talk about <laughs> junctions and, and life fuck up moments like that, yeah. that was... That was the highest that that, and I'd only been in Australia for six months. So, well, I was, was new here. I, I'm I'm from the UK, man. We drive <laughs> yeah. drunk all the time. I didn't yeah, know yeah, you guys yeah. were big on that. <laughs> so it, it was a case of do I just pack up and pack off home and tail between my legs? Uh, but I'm way too stubborn and proud for that, so stuck it out. Uh, and then a good few years later. And this is actually a pretty funny story. And this is where my battles with alcohol can be. It's a feast, and Lisa will tell you, it's a feast or a famine for me. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, again, I'd finished work. I was working on a Sunday. It was Easter Sunday. And a few of the uh, guys I played soccer with from, um, they're, you know, originally from the UK, they were like, oh, yeah, we're going to the Irish bar. We'll have a few beers Easter Sunday. Cool. And in, in Gladstone, where I was living, there's, there's two lanes. Ironically, there's two lanes. <laughs> And uh, I needed to be in the right-hand lane to drive, to take the turn to get to my house, to drop my car off, to then get the cab back to the pub. But this guy wouldn't let me come into the right lane. So I ended up being in the left lane. So I thought, and this is this is that sliding doors moment. Yeah. No, oh, fuck it. I'll just have a quick beer and then I'll, you know, I'll take the car home or whatever. Ten pints later. <laughs> and that's a lot. Um and I can smile about it now, but it's certainly not not fucking good by any stretch of the margin. But yeah, yeah ten pints later, still in my work clothes, um, and another sliding doors moment. My friend's wife, who came to pick him up, brought her friend, so there was one less seat in the car to drop me off at home. 
And me being me, I, oh, I've got to go to work in the morning. Yeah. No, dude. So I was like, fuck it. I, I, it's like three kilometers to my house. Jump in the car. 50 meters later, the cops pull me over. Um, Just like right out of the pub parking lot. <laughs> yeah. Straight away. Yeah. It was like onshore for the cops to see all day. And then they see that car driving down the road. So, um, yeah. And that would, that would like, and I blew big numbers, like big numbers. Um, I think I was like four times the limit. Point, point two, point I two. Was, point I two, was yeah. point two eight oh. on the way to the bar. Yeah. Yeah. It's, so yeah, like feast or famine. I, I associate with that very, very much. So that is yeah. generally like, oh. Not only do I tend to have an addictive personality, I tend to be very all or none in most mm. things in my life. Um, and I'm those two things in concert, like those are hard. Uh, I definitely mm. went through, I went through some periods of time where like the struggle was much greater than the struggle is today. Mm. But I did really try to approach it with the ability to like, detach my identity and exercise control because the uh, fucking spoiler alert also like i don't make great decisions all the time my <laughs> first job that i got after my dui and rehab got me kicked out of the military was working in a bar so i worked in a <laughs> club in downtown seattle um, which gave me a lot of exposure to it and i drank for sure more than i should but at least i had the ability to like start building that relationship and maybe it was like it's like the person that's new to the gym that just decides to go to the fucking competitors class. <laughs> and they're like, do you know what a thruster is? And they're like, never heard it a day <laughs> in my life. And they're like, all right, we're doing double fran. Yeah. Don't worry about it. You'll figure it out. And they're like, what the fuck is happening? I don't like this anymore. <laughs> like that was a lot of it for me. Um, there was a lot of like feast or famine until I learned to have snacks and meals. Like if we're staying mm -hmm. the same analogy. And so that's, that's really kind of like where it exists for me present day. And there've been a lot of like iterations and ebbs and flows. And there've been times that it hasn't been delivered at all. And there've been times that um, at the beginning of this year, Vanessa and I didn't drink for like 90 days or something like that. And not, not because anything really bad had happened, but it was just, you know, resetting kind of the baseline. And a lot of people do it often with their nutrition, right? They're just like, mm -hmm. eh, I've gotten a little bit fucking like soft through the middle and lazy with my like, macros or whatever and so just kind of like a little bit of a tune-up to like exercise control um it is a thing that we do use both to relax um and also as like a state change or like a de-stressor like you know the end of a shitty day so to speak oh. so um where we've kind of built some like rules around or at least kind of like our, our groundwork and what's working for us right now is not keeping anything in the house. Um, we've found that like for us just having inventory on hand, it just makes it, it makes it too easy to make it not intentional and deliberate. I guess like that's the, the overriding oh. thing is my engagements with alcohol are deliberate and intentional. Um, that's kind of like the baseline. And then we figured out that not having stuff in the house, unless it is like, like last night, getting one bottle of wine for a specific, like very intentional, deliberate reason, like cool. But generally outside of that, we've really lately, um, the last several months just been not drinking at the house. It just, there's like a really badass convenience store, like right at the <laughs> one, two entryways to the neighborhood. And at one of them, there's this place called Foodies that has like a bakery, a taco bar. They make pizzas. They've got an incredible beer and wine selection. Like it's too much of a good thing and it's too easy and convenient. And that's like an important realization is like decision making ability after you have started to go down that road generally ends up being pretty fucking shitty. Um, okay. So like being able to make better decisions is just like, we just try to not do it at home. And some of that I think is modeling stuff, you know, as, as parents who really do seek to have a very deliberate, intentional, like engagement in parenting. Um, and also knowing like the exposure that we had from our own parents stuff, Vanessa's parents don't really have any like issues with alcohol and um, my, my biological parents for sure do. 
like didn't want to have like be that dad that's got a fucking beer every night didn't want to be like that couple that had wine every night and not that there's anything wrong with it but if we look at the life that we want to build and the identities that we choose to assume if i've got a fucking magic wand and i'm like casting the spell for the best version of my life how it looks not how it would feel in that moment because if it was like magic wand how it would feel in the moment it's me on top of like the giant fucking mansion, like glass of wine in my hand. Like this is some good <laughs> life that I'm living. <laughs> but if it's about being that person in that place every day for the rest of my life, trying to imagine walking around with that glass of wine or that beer, like all day, every day, if I've got a, maybe that's a good decision-making framework to share for me. Like I try to think about things on a continuum. And if I'm ever like in a point of conflict or turmoil, I'm like, well, what if we go all the way the other direction? What does it start to look like? And like, even if my life is still categorically, objectively, subjectively, really, really incredible, but like in that vision, I've got that glass or that bottle every day. I don't like how that looks and feels. Even if mm. everything else was totally on track. And I know in my fucking heart of hearts that like this thing does not keep all that other shit on track as well. And so that I think is like, that's the big struggle, at least for a lot of people like in our community. I know that that's a big topic right now. A lot of people are like kind of sober curious. They're like, I have this thing that has demonstrably reliably showed that it fucks my life up and I'm bad at it. There's not a single positive redeeming quality that I could truly defend and justify. What do I have to do with this information? Hmm. Right? <laughs> like every time I hit myself in the foot with a hammer, it hurts so bad and fucks my feet up. And you're like, so are you going to stop doing it? And you're like, I don't know, man. <laughs> the hammer looks like it needs I'm a, a swing. I'm, I'm attached <laughs> to that hammer. And I think, too, the struggle people have, and if we talk about it in, in our space in CrossFit, people very much tend to be all or nothing. Like they're, you know, they don't go to the gym two or three times a week and they're just, you know, dropping in. It's seven days. It's full on. Or they're not there for three weeks and they're either RX or they, they don't give a shit and they're, they're half assing it. And that's, well, that's, like, yeah, people that, like that's our mentality. Like and yeah. there, is, there is a consistent trending of that personality type in this community. And it's also hard because this community has a lot of like social and cultural bonds that also trend towards alcohol. Yeah. And it's, it's like for me, like I would used to do the whole go out every weekend and, you know, crack on. When I live by myself, I used to drink, just because I could, because you know it's like the Disney fuck it. Why not? When you're a kid, why not? You're a kid, I'm an adult. I can just go in that well, store, and buy that shit. <laughs> yes, big ass adult on the way thing. home. But it's <laughs> it's once I got past the struggle of it doesn't have to be all or nothing. It can be, you know, and I guess too for me owning the gym kind of directed me in that because I'm like, well, I've got to work tomorrow. I'm not going to drink, you know, and it kind of set up some some parameters, but and some bumpers, but still one my biggest thing getting around it was once i got my head around the it doesn't have to be all or nothing you can have a little of column a and a little of column b and everything's going to be okay but you don't want to have them you know either way it's like okay you've had had column a you've had a taste that's good now let's come back to column b and just try and keep that scale level and because i wasn't trying then to force myself to be 100 percent zero or a or just a three-year-old let loose it's just you know finding that balance and it, it became a lot easier in my head to go i'm not trying to make myself fit into a particular square it's like you can have a little bit of everything it's, you know you can't just live on chicken broccoli and water it's okay to have i mean you can you know, but you're gonna be fucking miserable and when you go yeah. off the rails you're probably gonna go really goddamn really. far off the rails yeah. yeah and it's and it makes you not not so much the more you deprive yourself is that's when you want something more if you're like actively depriving yourself and not trying to find that that space where you could have some or a little, that's where you get into the conflict internally. And then it usually turns into a, a shit fest, basically. Yeah. Of, yeah. of what you didn't want get, to happen. Like, so after I got caught DUI that Easter, um, I went sober, obviously, as you do, like massive knee jerk reaction. Fuck this. I'm never drinking again. I'm turning into my dad. This is exactly what I didn't want to happen. Yeah. And then, um, the next day signed up to run the gold coast marathon and stayed sober for like seven or eight weeks trained really well was hitting some good times i was like fuck yeah you were a runner at this point yeah so i'm an okay, ex-marathon okay. i didn't know if it was like 
That's it. I no, am no, 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 no. entirely a new human. <laughs> no, no, no. So I've, I've run a few mar- So I've, I'd run a few marathons before then, and I was like, right, oh, well, generally things that help me is training, and I need some focus, so fuck it. Uh, the Gold Coast Marathon's in seven or eight weeks. I'm training for that. And then um, I got two and a half kilometers in and pulled my hamstring. Continued on till <laughs> continued on to like the halfway point until I was realized there's no way I could carry on. Got the medicab back to the start line because I was like at burly heads. I was like the furthest point away. I was at the turnaround point. And just walked straight to the pub and just got shit faced. <laughs> I was like, yeah, it's, it's really not what it's supposed to be. But yeah. So what is like what is your current relationship? Oh, the other thing is so we generally don't have it in the house unless it's a specific amount for a specific time for a specific reason that is intentional. So like not in the house. And then if we have it yeah. out, we're limited to two drinks. That's um, kind of like our current construct. Yeah, I, th- I think. Um, See, for because I work so I'm work seven and seven, so I'm away from home for seven days, and then I'm at home for seven days where I've got no nine to five job to go to. You know, the only thing that I've got to get up for is my family and taking the kids to to daycare, or if I want to train before I do that. But because I've got all day to to myself, then I don't have to get up at five a.m. to get my training in before I take the kids or um. So my relationship at the moment is I built a kegerator. So I turned a refrigerator into a home bar. Uh, And it's good. I like it. Um, But I was probably drinking like three or four pints a night just because I could, because it was there. Yeah. Uh, And I've kind of let it run out and I purposefully haven't refilled it. Uh, And I've started drinking not percent beers. Um, so there's there's a good six to ten not percent beers in my fridge, but there's also uh, some bottles of white wine, yeah, uh, some heavy beers. Um, uh, what else? And, and but red wine. So red wine. I love red wine. Same. Uh, so I had a glass last night because it was at the very end of a bottle. So a bottle of red wine would last me three or four nights. But what I try and do is I try and buy a bottle when I come home from work and I'll only have a glass of red wine if I'm having steak or Italian food. So last night we had spaghetti. So I had a glass of red wine. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of where I'm trying to sit at the moment. It's not like I need to do it. Um, Australian culture, backyard barbecue culture, similar to America, I suppose, but, um, Man, Three or four you, o'clock. you spend long enough, you realize like the whole world trends way closer to issues with alcohol rather yeah. than further away from it. Like yeah. outside of really tight, like generally religious cultures and regions, like most of the yeah, world yeah. like is is struggling to figure out like, what do I do with this? Yeah. Uh, it, so it was, it was weird. Like when I, when I lived in the UK, like we very rarely had alcohol in the house. <clears throat> if you wanted a beer on a Tuesday night, you had to go to the fucking pub. And that's, but that's the culture. That's what everybody done. But you'd walk in on a Tuesday night and it's like built like somebody's lounge with a fire on and all of your mates there. And it's weird because you didn't like, you, there's no social media. You didn't see on Facebook that somebody was at the pub. Yeah. So you just walk in and everybody's there and it's like, oh, hey, it's Tuesday. Yeah, right. Oh, let's have a few pints. I don't know. Um, so yeah, I'm switching to these zero percent alcohol beers, um, and they they actually don't taste ridiculous. No, they taste reasonably good, but like for me, I just like it. It's like, what's the point? Because like my engagement in alcohol is generally like I do enjoy the taste and the flavor. Really enjoy like whiskey, beer, red wine. Those are my like top three. Enjoy the taste very much though, but. It is the altered state of consciousness and the feels that I like. That's bigger for me than the taste. Yeah, uh, and I'm I'm very much the same, and that's why I'm a feast or a famine. Like, yeah, I'll hmm. I'll either if I have three, I'm having thirty. Hmm. That's that's where. Is that I where am. you? That's kind of like where you know that like 
three. Three has got to be three. like hard limit because if you go to number four, it's off the rails. Yeah. So so the other night, I think it was Thursday, I got home from work on the Wednesday, and I was like, yeah, right, early, you know, I'll, um, I'll have a beer. You know, Jess and I, you know, we're just talking. It's cool, you know, just in the kitchen. Kids went to bed. We went into the media room. And, um, yeah, I just had a few beers. Oh, I was mowing the lawn, listening to oh, man. podcast, actually, funnily enough, I was listening to used to. <laughs> and, um, I was just, like, cruising around, and it was, like, then I finished that, and I was, like, you know what? Whenever I finish mowing the lawn, I was just, like, sitting down, looking in my garden. And I was, like, I'll have a beer. And then I had another beer, and I think I had three beers. And then by then, I was, like, is, you know, they're 5% beers, you know, so they're, you know, heavier than Reasonable. standard. And I was like, oh, yeah, this, this is really good. Oh, yeah, I've got a bottle of red wine. Oh, yeah, we're having steak or whatever we're having. Yeah, yeah. I'll have... And I had like two reasonably sized glasses of red wine. Yeah. And that was me. That's, and that's, I'm, I'm happy being there. And it generally doesn't go too, too much further than that these days. Um, but Saturday, Saturday was probably a big one for me. So the, the the mother and the father in law came around and we ha we haven't caught up for a, for a fair while um, just the four of us and the kids and again barbecue and I didn't have any beers didn't have any beers which was weird I had like a few zero percent beers yeah uh, and then just had a oh the father in law likes making margaritas so we had a margarita and then I had many 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 glasses of red wine. And just woke up on Sunday and I was a shitty human. I was a shitty husband. I was a shitty dad. I was a shitty human to myself as well. So, yeah. Um, but like, and it, I wasn't a complete write off. Like, we went and, you know, I went and watched a mate do a CrossFit competition. Poppy yeah. had soccer finals in the morning. Like, it, I wasn't yeah, a write off. It's a hard part to navigate, right? Like, when you're at this level, you're like, I, I've built an intentional, deliberate relationship with it. Cause, like, I would venture to guess that, like, that night you're like, I'm feeling pretty good. I'm going <laughs> to drink more than I should. I'm going to feel yeah. kind of shitty tomorrow, but, like, I am choosing to drink more. Yeah. 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 It, it's, uh, yeah. yeah. Like, but, and I think, like, if we talk about shit like that out loud and you're like, yeah, dude, like, sometimes, even though, like, I try to limit myself to two glasses or whatever, like, sometimes I intentionally make the choice, like, I'm going to get drunk and yeah. I'm going to fucking regret it. I'm going to feel dumb tomorrow. But, like, <laughs> in this moment, I am choosing this course of action. Then, like, can you still rectify it the next day and be like, yep, today years old when I realize that I still feel just as shitty when I drink that much <laughs> and, like. Maybe on a longer timeline, it's less and less. Well, I know it's less, dude. Like, how old are you now? 37. When was the last time you drank like you were fucking 21 or 22? Oh, New Year's Eve. <laughs> and then New prior Year's to Eve. That. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Like, potentially uh, years? Uh, yeah, pro probably in the last. Probably in the last three or four years, I could probably, oh, uh, in the last two years, certainly, I can probably count on on one hand the amount of times I've been, like, right off the next day drunk. Yeah. yeah. And, like, how often did you, not necessarily that you, man you managed it better back then, but how often did you ingest that amount of alcohol in your, like, early 20s? Oh, every weekend. Right. And like you had your, your recovery capacity was way better. And like there wasn't as much opportunity cost to it. And like blah, 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 a million fucking reasons. Um, and so like on a long enough timeline, is it trending in the right direction? Oh, yeah, for sure. Like, it, right. It, it like, you know, to... when, when else did you ever endeavor to have like deep discussions about alcohol and addiction with somebody to be like, well, how do you think about this? How do you manage it? Yeah. So, like, uh, and I guess... I guess that the, probably the big thing for me now is um, so obviously you've got Liam um, and Poppy for me was was really good, but it kind of wasn't really the same as my dad and I. Yeah. But then when Henry came along, there's that direct relationship between father and son, and I'm like, 
fuck that was a complete like i remember like that's, the yeah week. that's all i know so i don't know if it would be like a different experience for me with a daughter but with me and liam it wasn't even there there's a big element of the modeling the influencing like setting this kind of like more idealized standard but a lot of it dude just straight up like kids wake up fucking early bro that that's like been an actual piece of vanessa and i being like we're not gonna drink that much because he wakes up early all the time yeah and like that's a really good beneficial piece that has helped us shape like better behavior um not that like that's the only reason we don't get like super fucked up but like that that's not yeah. nothing right and yeah. and so it's like you know what do you want to model how do you yeah. want to like have to tolerate life right because you said like on that sunday like you were not a sterling shining example of like a man a husband or a father and like that sucks to sit in and it feels bad and at least like where i'm at at this point i'm becoming more and more aware of that higher cost while i'm in that kind of like present stage of being resilient against like you know the demon on my shoulder fighting with the angel of my conscience like i i know past like these next couple of drinks that tomorrow's just gonna be so bad that it becomes less worth it and mm -hmm. i've found that like i'm able to have that conversation more deliberately further into like a day and night or an evening um don't always get it right, but at least like that's kind of where I'm at is like, you know, am I choosing each of my drinks? And that's been like a powerful frame for me to operate from. It's like, hey, I want to go to the bar and get another drink. Be like, are you choosing to get another drink or are you just kind of like in a habit loop and you're having a lot mm -hmm. of fun and it seems like a good idea, but have you really stopped and thought about it? Yeah. Like, what is the contract that you made with yourself earlier? How do you really feel now? What's going to be the next thing that happens in the night after this? If this one, then what? Like, you know, are we really thinking it through that it's an intentional, deliberate action? Or it's like, it's super fucking easy when somebody gets up and they're like, anybody want a beer? You're like, I sure don't not want a beer. And you didn't ask if a beer was a good idea. You didn't ask me if I should have a beer. You didn't ask me who has chosen to have another beer. You asked me, would I like another beer? And so those are the set of words that I'm forced to contend with saying yes or no to. And that's mm. very, very different than who should have another drink or who's choosing mm. to have another beer. What I like when it's mm. a bitch. And so like, I don't know, maybe that's helpful. Mm. Like, am I choosing to have another drink or would I just like to have one? Mm. Yeah, I guess that, yeah, that's, that's definitely a, that's definitely a thing. Like I'm getting better with age, but you know, even, even drinking zero percent, alcohol beers like poppy and henry don't know that they're zero percent they just say that dad is having another beer from the fridge so the the relation that. like i mm. feel better but they don't fucking know like i didn't even you know that, like, that at all i could be too yeah that maybe even makes it worse right because they're like yeah. this dude can fucking drink like <laughs> beers in a row and he is still good to mow the lawn it's unbelievable <laughs> he has incredible drinking capacity as a bloodline yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I am invincible. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So yeah, like, and and I guess that's that's the thing for me as well. So it's um, I I I need I need to structure some some more boundaries around around my weeks off, um, and 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 times. You know, you know, it's it's five o'clock somewhere. Then how's about starting your own fucking time zone? That's that's always Ooh. a good one. Whoa, that that's is a good, a good one. one. I think that's a that's yeah. probably a good closing note. Yeah, I think Start that's a that's... time zone. No, that's good, man. Well, thank yeah. you, thank you for the opportunity to kind of talk through all this stuff. Um, I don't know. I certainly don't have all of it figured out whatsoever, but I hope that there's <laughs> something in that that's helpful for for Liam, for you, for anybody else that listens. Um, it's helpful for me to talk through. So, still self serving in all of this. I'm still figuring it out every fucking day. <laughs> I think I think that's the uh, the beauty of it all. That's what we're all doing, and that's what makes us the people we are. And I guess that's why we like you know us three and you know Colin and I have always connected well and could have these sort of conversations. And like you and I, Chuck, is you know we we got enough self awareness to be able to reflect on things and and call ourselves on our own bullshit and also surround ourselves with people that will tend to do that. So, you know, we're all figuring it out, but we're actively trying to figure it out rather than just going, well, fuck it, let's go. 
It's uh, <laughs> just trail just, of destruction behind us. Yeah, just just have at it. So I have enjoyed you guys talking this morning. It it's been a certainly a a big uh, privilege for me to, as I said, sit with my two favourite humans and and discuss life stuff with you guys. And uh, I know we'll do it again soon. So thank you, gentlemen. Well, thank you, dudes. We'll see you later.